Today, Christian friends, we are going to take a look and try to understand the knuckle-buster of them all. And this is the parable of the unjust steward. Now, probably you've never heard a sermon on this text. And if you haven't heard a sermon, it's not to be wondered at, because this is usually the text that the Christian preacher and writer and interpreter and teacher runs away from like the plague. And the reason is that the story looks like somebody cheats his master and then he's commended for being a liar and a thief. And the listener is told, you go do the same thing. And so because it's so complicated, people just sort of kind of throw up their hands in holy horror. And when they're sort of preaching through Luke, they usually come to this one and kind of slide over it and go on. And in fact, Julian the Apostate, the Roman emperor at, in the fourth century, who tried to return the Roman Empire back to paganism after it had become Christian, used this as his primary text. He said, look at this. Here we have this carpenter from Palestine, and he actually teaches his people to be liars and thieves. And we, the Romans, with our high concept of morality and our high standards of justice, we can't have this kind of nonsense polluting our consciousness and perverting the morals of our young people. So we've got to get rid of Christianity and we've got to go back to Roman paganism. All right, now, what are we going to do with this story? How on earth are we going to understand it? And we'll find critically the question as to whether or not this story is directly connected with the story that follows. Because usually what the interpreter has done, he kind of fiddles around and can't figure out the parable, and then he comes to the discussion of mammon, which follows, and says, aha, well now this kind of explains it. And so they try and put the two together. And I will try and convince you that that's not why that second passage is there, and we should have a big fat paragraph break between the two. But before we do that, let's look at the parable itself. And if you will follow along on the sheet, which I trust has been passed out to you, you'll be able to see the flow of ideas, even if you're unable to read completely the words on the screen in front of you. Here is our parable. Again, we've got seven scenes. Scene number one, we're told about the rich man and about the steward and about the problem that has been created by his dishonesty. Then this problem now intensifies, or we could say, here's the problem, you're going to get fired. And then second thing, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm going to get fired, and this sets up now the problem. And then the fourth scene is the climax in the middle in which he finally figures out what he's going to do, but like a good storyteller, we don't know what it is. It unfolds before us. And so then, even as we had up here two scenes which told us about the problem, we now have two scenes explaining the solution. And then finally, the last scene at the end, and the master is pleased. And we have to figure out how come he's pleased after he got cheated again once more. All right, with this seven-scene movement of the parable, let's turn back to the story itself and try to proceed and ask the hard questions about what the story means in the light of the culture of the Middle East. Scene one, we're told about the setting of the story. There was a rich man who had a steward, and charges were brought to him that he was wasting his goods. All right? Who brought these charges? Well, we're not told. But the assumption, of course, is that the friends of the master in the community are walking in and telling him, don't trust this character because he's robbing you blind. Thereby we know that the community has a good relationship with this master. The master is respected and appreciated, and there is no hint of any criticism of his character. If he were himself a rascal, and nobody liked him, they wouldn't bother to go in and say, don't trust your employee. 
So please notice from the very first lines, we've got three kinds of people involved. There's the steward, and there is his master, and there is the community. One of the critical areas of misunderstanding, potential misunderstanding of the parables, is to forget that in the Middle East, no person ever acts as an individualist by himself. He's always a person reacting within a community. And if you look around in the parables of Jesus, sure enough, almost always you'll find the community in some way is reflected. Here they are. They're streaming into the master and saying, don't trust so-and-so, you're getting robbed blind. Also, notice that in the parables of Jesus, when there are two major characters, there is never a, a case in which both of them are evil. If one character is evil, the other is good, and there is a contrast between them. In this case, the steward himself is a liar and a thief, and there is no hint of suspicion that the master is dishonest. Now, the reason I press for this is that the interpretation of this parable is long. Every major scholar, it seems sooner or later, tries to interpret it. I spent a long time reading all of this literature, and I have a file of over 75 major scientific articles in German, English, and French trying to unlock this parable. Everybody tries, and you cannot imagine the amount of nonsense that's been written about this because people have misunderstood the culture out of which the parable evolves. So the two characters are not partners in crime, if you please. And as we will see, the scene is not a banking scene. All of the interpreters of this story have got to decide right up at the top, are we talking about bankers? And do we have two rascally bankers that we're dealing with? Or are we talking about a farm and thereby a landed estate and an estate owner and an agricultural manager who's running the, the estate? Well, I'm convinced that we're talking about farmers and not bankers. And so what I will try to make clear to you grows out of that confidence, partly because bankers are not hinted at, they are not loaning money, these are rents, and the rents are themselves agricultural produce, and thereby we can assume a farming scene. Okay, scene one is the master is told this character is dishonest. So what happens in scene two? He calls in the dishonest steward, and he says to him, what is this that I am hearing about you? Now, this is a classic first opener. Uh, I myself, uh, over 20 years ago, had this pulled on me. I was a teacher in a Middle Eastern school, and it seems that the headmaster wanted some information out of me, so he called me in and he said, Bailey, what is this I'm hearing about you? And you say to yourself, who's he been talking to? And so you get scared, and you try and think of all the conversations you've had over the past month in which the name of the headmaster came up, and you quickly report to him all the things that you may or may not have said about the school or about the way he's running it. And you confess to him all kinds of information that he didn't have. That is, if you blow it, like I did. But this character is too smart. He's sharper than I am, and he probably had used this same technique with other servants. He'd call them in and say, what's this I'm hearing about you? And then the fellow starts talking, and you find out all kinds of stuff that's going on in the back alleys. But no, this fellow has been told, he's been given an order by his master, report, sorry, by, yes, by the master, report, and he stands there without a word. He knows the game, and he's not going to play it. Okay? The master then discovers that he's too smart, and he's not going to extract from him with these well-known techniques any more information. Never mind. He's got quite enough information to can him anyway. So he says to him, turn in the account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Now, the word account here in Greek has the definite article on it. 
And when it, this word used with the definite article, it means the account books. Turn in the account books because you're finished. Now, I've tried to trace the exact, precise definition of the, the law that underlies this in the Mishnah, the codification of the laws of the period the, by the, written by the Jews, and it's very precise. Anybody who engages an agent, if he notifies the agent or he notifies the people with whom the agent is dealing, he doesn't have to notify both of them, even if word has not reached one or the other, if he notifies one of them, everything the man does after that point is not valid. So the master is now telling this fellow, you're fired, go get the account books. He doesn't ask him to balance them. They're probably perfectly balanced. All the money that is missing will not show up in the books. And if the fellow hasn't balanced them, if he tries to, it'll be even a worse mess trying to unlock everything. He's told, go get those accounts and turn them in. You've had it. All right, now from the point he's told this, nothing he does in the story is legally binding on the master, according to first century Jewish law. We have to understand that and remember it in order to understand the story. Now, what do we expect this fellow to do? Well, in the Middle East, you never dismiss an ordinary servant, let alone a manager, with about, without about three days of negotiation. And so what do we expect this fellow to do? Well, first of all, he's going to say, oh, you can't be serious. I mean, I have served you, and my father has served your father, and my grandfather served your grandfather, and we're not going to let this beautiful three-generation relationship be, be destroyed over a little thing like money. You can't be serious. Or then he'll say, well, you know, this really isn't my fault. I mean, I've done my best, but I haven't got a thousand eyes. I can't watch everything. And all the rest of these people I'm dealing with are all liars and thieves, and I can't watch it all, and you're not here some of the time, and I've done my best. Or he can say, you know, uh, it, it really isn't my fault because you haven't given me the right staff. You remember the story of Adam and Eve in which Adam is, uh, is first of all caught, and he's told what's going on here, and Adam says, the woman whom thou gavest me. You see, it wasn't my fault, God. If you'd given me a decent woman, we wouldn't have any problems. But you gave me this so-and-so, and now I'm in a mess. And so it's not really my fault, it's yours. Well, that didn't get him anywhere. And then along comes Eve, and she bats her long eyelashes and says, well, the serpent deceived me. You know, poor little me, I'm really not that bright. And that didn't get her anywhere either. And Adam, first of all, started off by lying, and he said, I went and hid from you because I was naked. He wasn't. He went and hid because he was afraid. Anyway, all of this didn't do them the slightest bit of good. This fellow was smart enough to walk out of the master's presence without offering any excuses, the last of which would have been to go out and have his friends come in one after another and say, this poor fellow, I mean, you know, his family, they're here in the village, and how's he going to get another job if you dismiss him for being dishonest, and his kids are going to starve half to death, and, you know, let's try and see if we can't work out this little personal misunderstanding. All right, none of this is said. He's smarter than both Adam and Eve and most of the rest of us, and he's smart enough to, to know, as we would say in Arabic, Ainu Maftuha, his eye is opened. That is, he knows this is the kind of a master to whom you can offer 75,000 excuses if you're smart enough to think them up, and none of them are going to do you any good. He knows, and don't try and tell him that you're innocent because you aren't. So silence is consent, and so when he walks out from the presence of that master, having said nothing, it's evident he accepts the reality of his guilt, a very important aspect of the story. So then what does he say, having left the presence of the master, having said nothing? 
in his own self-defense. I have tried Middle Easterners in positions of authority again and again over the past 20 years and asked them, have you ever dismissed a servant? And he walked out of the room having made no attempt to try and defend himself, and the answer is never. Unthinkable. So something very unusual has happened here, and this is important for us to recognize theologically. We are caught before God, and we cannot offer excuses for the evil that has erupted out of our lives. Okay, so then the steward says to himself, this is the next scene. He's left the master. He's now on his way to get the accounts and turn them in. And so we have this little monologue talking to himself. Mind you, he knows he's fired, but nobody else does. So what does he say? He says, what shall I do because my master is taking the stewardship away from me? Now that means, you see, I'm fired. Nothing I do from now on is legal, but the thing really isn't totally finalized until I take those accounts and I turn them in and give them to him. That's what he's in process of now doing. So he says, I am not strong enough to dig. That means not strong enough to take a hoe and work as a laborer in the fields. He, he, he's been busy at a desk all his life. Now, this is to his credit. Usually people with responsibility aren't willing to do manual labor. He is, but he says, I physically don't have the physique for it. And he says, I'm ashamed to beg. Not everybody is, but he is. So there are some redeeming qualities on this guy. With this fellow, not only is he smart, but he has some qualities we can admire. All right, in the middle he says, I know what I will do. So that when the thing is finalized, when I finally turn in those accounts and everybody finds out that I'm fired, they may receive me into their own houses. This is another idiom. In this case, it's an idiom that occurs in Greek literature. I have found it in the writing of Epictetus. This is a Greek philosopher, a Stoic philosopher of the end of the first century, and this phrase means to get another job. Somebody receive you into their house means to hire you in the extended establishment of the great houses of the day. The only thing he knows how to do is to be a steward at managing somebody's estate, and that's what he wants to go on doing. But he's got to somehow go out with the approval of the community, or he's not going to get another job. So how's he going to do that? All right. He says he's got an idea. The light bulb goes on, and gradually his plan begins to unfold. So what are we told in scene five? So summoning his master's debtors one by one. What's he doing? How do you summon somebody else? You don't go to them. You send somebody to come back to you. Okay, so he's told the servants, go and get so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. The servants go. Why? Well, they think he's still in authority. They haven't got the word yet. And when he sends the word out to those people who have debts owing to the master, they come. Why? because they assume he is still in authority. If they knew he were no longer in authority, they wouldn't come. Why are they coming? Of course, they assume he has some word from the master that is important enough that they are being called in to be notified. All right? These are precisely the assumptions that this clever rascal wants these people to come in with. He didn't go to them. He summoned them so that they would think he was still in authority. When they show up, he says, how much do you owe my master? Now, this is not a question for information. I have watched Middle Eastern estate managers do this. They've got the accounts. Here I am. I'm the estate manager. You're the farmer. You walk in and I say, okay, now how much do you owe my master? It's written in front of me. And if you quote the same price that I have written here, then we don't have to argue about this. If it's not the same, then I have to say, no, 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 we agreed on 100, don't you remember? And then you say, no, no, it was only 75. Then we start debating. 
and I finally call in witnesses and the whole bit to establish that I have not fiddled with the document and we are agreeing that everything is okay. So this fellow calls the man in, how much do you owe my master? The man says, the first one says, a hundred measures of oil. All right, take the bill, sit down and write quickly 50. Now that was 500 denarii, the worth of the material. 500 denarii is the, is the wages for a man for a year and a half. Why does he want them to do the writing? Why doesn't he write it? He wants it in their handwriting, and he wants them to do it one at a time because he doesn't want people talking to one another. Somebody might figure out his game. You see, if they know he's already been fired, they won't do it. If you and I are employees of the same company, and you say, here's a clever trick and we're going to cheat the boss, I'll tell you, you do whatever you like. I want no part in this. If we sell Ford cars and you say we're going to cheat the company, I say, look, I want to keep my franchise. If these people cooperate with, the mas with this fellow in a trickery, next year the master doesn't rent to them. But they think everything's okay. And of course, they're going to ask this fellow, hey, big deal, how come these reductions? And then this clever steward will say, well, you know, I know things are tough out in the field, the worms are bad, and the rain hasn't been very good, and I know you guys are really sweating, and I talked the old man into it. And the answer is, oh, that's very nice of him, and thanks a lot, Joe, for really helping us out. Okay, so everybody signs, they all go back to the village, everybody now starts a great big party in celebration of the most generous man who ever rented land in the entire village and what a nice guy he's got for Stuart because he managed to talk the old man into this tremendous reduction. All right, The clever rascal walks in with all of these now quickly changed bills with the ink barely dry and the signature of all of his business associates and with the cat that ate the canary smile on his face, he puts this under the master's nose and the master looks at it and he's got two choices. Legally, he can go back to that village and say, sorry, fellas, when he gave you those discounts, he was dismissed and you got to pay. If he does that, instead of praising him as the most generous man they ever do, they're all going to insult him as the most stingy man they ever dealt with. Or he can keep his mouth shut, pay the price of this clever rascal's salvation and continue to enjoy the just reputation which he has. He is a generous man. We know that because he dismissed this steward and didn't send him to jail, which he had the legal right to do. He could have sold him as a slave to get the money back. He didn't do that either. You see, what this clever man discovered in the middle of the story was, my master has been very generous with me. Is this generosity that which motivates his life at the deepest level? I'm a clever rascal, and I am going to press on that and see what happens. He does, and sure enough, the master pays the price for his salvation. He goes out the hero of the community. Oh, they'll find out that he pulled a clever trick. They'll watch him, but they can use a man who's that smart. This is the psychology of an oppressed minority and the peasantry of first century Palestine were so oppressed. Very dangerous story, but at the end of the story, Jesus says, this fellow is a son of darkness. And he was smart enough to know his only hope was to trust in an unqualified manner on the mercy of his master. When he jumped that way with all of his eggs in that basket, he was saved, and that's the only way he could jump. It's like the story of the prodigal son which comes before it. To throw yourself upon the unqualified mercy of the master is the only hope of salvation for this liar and thief. And Jesus says he's a son of darkness and he's not commending his dishonest ways, but his intelligence. He knew which way to jump. He knew the mercy of his master was his only hope. And says Jesus, I wish you fellows, the sons of light, who are not going to use his lying and his deception, I wish you were as intelligent as he was and knew that you too can only jump that direction. All right, now let's take a very quick look as in our last five minutes 
at what happens in the next text. Here we are. I'm convinced that this is another topic. The story of the unjust steward is discussing not money, but the question of salvation. This text is talking about what should you do with your money. This is a very tricky phrase, and probably best understood, it means rely, uh, build up for yourselves treasures in heaven rather than treasure on earth. The friends and the they is a circumlocution for God. Uh, the rabbis, as Jeremias of Germany has, has pointed out, use this plural in the passive to refer to God and his angels. So use your money in a fashion so that you will be building up treasures in heaven that God may receive you into the eternal tents. And then we come now to the end of this passage and we find that you cannot serve two masters. You've got to serve one or the other, either God or mammon. And these invert. Two masters hate love, love, hate, and two masters. And in the middle, Jesus gives us the strongest phrase that we have in all the writings of Jesus in regarding honesty with money. How does it go? He, it's a play on words in Aramaic. If in the unrighteous mamun, mamun is that which sustains physical life for you, you are not faithful, and faithful in Aramaic is the word amin. The truth in Aramaic, this reads amuna. Who will entrust to you? And the verb here is Yet men. And so from the word amen, amena, we've got now the same word used three times. If in the unrighteous mamun, you see that amena there, you are not amin, the amuna, who will yet men to you? If you got lost, please believe me that the root amena, meaning assurance and faithfulness, is the word that is at the heart of all four of these lines. And what is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you are not honest with money, God cannot trust you with knowledge of himself. And so thereby, Christian friends, in that passage, we have a very remarkable and, in a sense, frightening challenge. Why is there so much spiritual poverty around us? because too many people cheat, cheat on their income tax. That which is yours, that which is truly yours, says, says Jesus, is the truth of God. And that's not going to be given to you as long as you are unfaithful with that which belongs to somebody else, and that's your money. What do you mean it doesn't belong to, belong to me? Everything is God's. He gives it to me as a gift, and I am a steward of it. And as a steward of that which is my mamun, that which is given to me in my stewardship is not mine. I am a steward over it. It belongs to him. And if I am not faithful in its use, then I cannot expect that I should be trusted with that which is truly mine, namely, knowledge of God. So we have two stories. One is a story about salvation and the trusting of a generous master who will save us if we throw ourselves upon his mercy. The other is the story about how we must be faithful with that which God has given us in our money, and if we aren't, he will not reveal his truth to us. How come these are side by side? I think Luke has put them side by side because he knows the non-Middle Eastern reader, the Greek readers, will read this marvelous story, dearly loved by the church, but they will read it and misunderstand it. And so Luke looks around in his sources and he finds this poem about honesty with money. He puts it next so that in case you are a non-Middle Eastern reader, you read the parable and you said to yourself, gee, it looks like he's commending us when we're dishonest. You keep reading and you find the strongest possible statement about honesty with money. And you say to yourself, well, I didn't understand the story, but at least I know Jesus doesn't teach us to be dishonest. If we're able to see the paragraph division between the two, 
we can be enriched by the parable and its message and also enriched by the poem and its message also.